Alrighty, uh, pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker, Dr. Brian Schertz. Um, he received his MD PhD from the University of Pittsburgh and later conducted his residency at the University of Utah. Currently, he's an associate professor at, here at UW in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. And his research consists of looking at uh, family studies to understand very rare variants, but also looks at research uh, related to our work here, um, looking at information content such as uh, clinical and experimental data and how it can be used for uh, variant interpretation. So he'll be discussing that uh, now. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back after lunch. And it's nice that people have stayed despite the weather till the bitter end. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about application digital scanning to clinical interpretation. I am a lexigenic pathologist. That's what I spend um, some of my time doing. And when I'm not doing research into trying to understand um, uh, rare genetic variants and um, help families that, that have variants for, for different types of disease risk. And so we run into rare variants all the time. And one of the most challenging things to do is to try to figure out what they do. And I'm really grateful for people like you who are doing um, deputational scanning and functional studies um, for uh, genes where there are clinical phenotypes because it can be very, very, it can, it can be very, very useful. When I was presenting this, and I said I'd start with a, um, a true story. So this is in the not too distant past, actually this was last Friday, then I was looking at some data from some clinical data from a patient, and um, this is the, about all of the clinical phenotype we, we have. I can share it with you because it's not very identifiable. Um, there's probably people in this room who have a large head circumference. Um, and we saw this uh, variant. And the first thing we thought of when we saw this variant was, has anyone ever seen this before? Can we find it in ClinVar or any of the public databases? And we couldn't. This is one that this is the first, for all we know, this is the first time anyone's seen this variant in a human being. Um, there's another P10 variant that's at the same amino acid that's pathogenic. So we're thinking, well, you know, this might be interesting, it might be pathogenic. Um, and so you know, here, we, here we are, we looked up in ClinVar. And this is, this is what I got when I looked it up in ClinVar. You can look it up in ClinVar as well, and you'll see that there's nothing else there. Um, and so, of course, having the deputational scanning meeting in mind um, and knowing Doug Fowler, I thought, I know where I should do now. I need to go and find the data from the deputational scanning for um, P10 and figure out what it says and see if it helps me classify the variant. So th these are the results. It's hard to see here but the number is 1.02 and it says wild type like on there. So I was like, well, that was kind of disappointing. I thought that we might have a, 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 an answer for this patient and I'd have a cool story to tell you and say, look at this, we had this variant and the, we had got the data and we were able to help classify it. This is wonderful. So, so maybe, maybe, maybe this is a benign variant and it has nothing to do with, the, with this large head circumference in this patient. Um, then I looked up the pathogenic variant here and so this is, this is the one that's, the, that's classified by multiple laboratories as pathogenic. And it has a score that's almost exactly the same. And it's also classified as well type-like. Um, so, so what do I do with this information as, as, a, as a clinician for, for this patient? Um, you know, I, I saw Doug yesterday at the poster session and I commented on this and he said, oh yeah, my, the, the assay is great for pathogenic variants but it doesn't work very well for benign variants. Uh, for, for variants, if it says benign, you don't have a whole lot of confidence. If it says wild type-like, you have a whole, whole lot of confidence that it really is wild type-like. But if it says pathogenic, you could have a high confidence that it's really pathogenic. And you know, he, he knows that. Um, but the question is, has he communicated that effectively with the people who are using um, this data? And so, so I hope this, this informs us. This, this was uh, just a chance event. That this, is, this is the this is not the first time that I've seen a variant um, in, the, in the clinic or in, for clinical interpretation and gone to functional um, beta scores because I have friends that do these things and I know where they are and it's great. Um, and, and when the, you, the information can be useful, it, it's wonderful. Um, but the, the question is, how, the question that, that's, that's, that I'm going to try to answer is, how can I know and people like me who are looking at your data, how can we know um, what the best way is to, to, to use the data that, that you're providing. Um, so there's strengths and limitations of deputational scanning. So um, 
what are strengths, limitations, deviations, scanning? So the great thing is it's high throughput. This is, this is the strength that you can get lots of data on lots of different variants. Um, and, and the other really nice thing is that isolate, oftentimes can isolate a variant specific effect. You know, when we see a variant in a patient, we don't know if, it's, if, if the phenotype we're seeing, if the large head circumference is because, you know, so let's say it's a kid, we don't know if it's because both parents have a large head circumference or not, and how much we should weigh that in to our, calcula our, our thinking about um, how to, to analyze this specific variant. There's lots of things that happen in human beings that is difficult, that can be difficult to figure out. But when you do a deep mutational scan, when you're, when you're doing that, then you're oftentimes isolating that specific variant, or even sometimes isolating interactions. And, and that's really cool that you can isolate the specific variant and see the variant effect. Um, and the limitations are that there's the oftentimes no direct, well, usually there's no direct clinical phenotype assessment. And, and I, I've seen slides here where, where we're, we're trying to look at molecular phenotypes, which can be useful, but molecular phenotypes don't oftentimes have a one-to-one -one correlation with clinical phenotypes. Um, and, um, and also one of the other challenges is that there's varied outputs from different assays. For some, for, for when you're developing an assay, you become the expert of the assay and you know the strengths and limitations of it. Um, but that doesn't mean other people know the strengths and limitations of it. And when there's four different um, P53 demutational scans and you're trying to figure out how to correlate the information from all of them and which one's the best one um, for, for you, if, if, they're all, if they all say the same thing, that's easy. But, but if they say different things, how do you know what's the right answer and, and which one you should use? So um, any slide about variant classification is required by um, precedent to have the ACMGM guidelines. And so here, here's the, the figure from the ACMGM guidelines. And here's functional data. Um, if you look at functional data, it's really interesting. I, I hope that the, I, I've asked them to update the new guidelines so that they work a little better for functional studies. Because for some reason, you can get supporting um, moderate and strong evidence toward pathogenicity with a functional study. Um, you can only get strong evidence against pathogenicity with a functional study. There's no such thing as, for some reason, there's, there's a blank here for functional studies. You can't get supporting evidence against something. And of course, um, moderate benign doesn't exist for some reason. I think that'll, that'll change when they do updates. Um, but but, but this, is what, this is what we're working with now um, in terms of uh, how to use functional data for variant classification. And, uh, and really, when, when you look at the, the functional studies, it's really only this and this and nothing in between um, because these are, are different types of, of, of functional data. Um, so here and here, the, the language is a well-established functional study that show deleterious effect or well-established functional studies show no deleterious effect. Um, so when the, so, so I was part of a broken beta work group, which we'll talk about a little bit about to, to um, say how functional studies should be used in um, clinical care. And um, this is really, the, the, the word that, 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 we, that we spent almost all of our time discussing was, what does well-established mean? Um, and it's something that, that, that's a challenging question. So what, what is well-established? Um, we know what a functional study is, but, we, but what's well-established? So does well-established mean that it's been around for a long time? I hope not, because um, if a better assay comes along, then it's by definition not as well-established, right? Um, does, it mean, does it mean that the number of replicates that, you, that you've done? Um, I think number of replicates is important. Does it mean that you've you know, done 100 variant, uh, uh, at least three replicates of each variant to, to establish that that's where that is and you can get a confidence interval, or do you need to do 10 of each variant? Um, or maybe that's not what it is at all. Does it mean endorsements? You know, if you get um, Julian Castro to endorse your functional study, does that mean it's going to win? I don't know. Um, does it mean citations in PubMed? If you get a lot of citations in PubMed, does that mean it's well established? This is science, right? This is not politics. If you want citations, citations is how you establish something. Um, well, we, we don't, I don't think it's any of these, um, but, but well established, this is just a, you know, show you that well established is an interesting term. Um, and, and it's not really well defined, unfortunately. Um, in the ACMG uh, guidelines criteria. Um, so, so one paper that, that's, that, that recently came out that um, attempts to define this is from the ACMG AMP sequence variant interpretation. This is from the, the ClinGen um, network or the, the ClinGen consortium. Um, and what they tried to do was they tried to say, we have this 
um, you know, pathogenic through PS3 or PS3 criteria for, for strong evidence against or strong evidence for. And if we want to get a functional study and put it in that hole, then what are the minimal guidelines for what they should do? And you know, one of the things they say is you need at least three clinical cases with benign and pathogenic variants to be able to define this. And there's at least 11 cases with benign and pathogenic variants to be able to define this, which um, is an interesting number. And you can read the paper if you want to figure out why they said at least 11. Um, when I read that, I thought, you know, if you're looking at an extremely rare phenotype and it's, you know, these are, you know, rare, not, not compatible with reproduction type things that you have to see something de novo, then 11 can be hard to get. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking at something like me with hereditary cancer risk, then, you know, 11 seems like an extraordinarily low number of, of patients who are affected to be able to, to, to do that. So, so um, anyways, so, so, so they have interesting recommendations there. Um, but what I'd like to, to talk about more is the recommendations for the collection use of multiplex functional variant data for interpretation from the Broughton Beatty Institute um, thing. And I'm not saying it because um, I'm on the paper. I'm not saying it because this is sponsored by the Broughton Beatty Institute, but I really think it's a better paper. Um, so I have a little arrow to cite this article um, for you to think about in the future. Um, but this is my completely unbiased um, opinion. And, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the article. And I think the people who worked on this were really good people, and many of them were in the room. And, and the other thing is because the, the, the framework at which they were, for, from which you were thinking of it, was really a, a scientific framework of what really is the evidence and what does create a good functional assay and how could that information be used effectively in clinical care rather than just saying, how can we fit something into this bin of BS4 or BS3 or PS3? Um, so, so, so that, that does the, the, so the, the paper is written kind of with different, with different um, mindsets and, and can, can be used with different mindsets as well. Um, so this is the, the, the main figure for, from the paper. And we'll go through this, um, we'll go through this uh, uh, the, for the next few slides in detail. We're not gonna talk a whole lot about this because we've already heard a lot of talks about this top A, B, C, and D um, part of it. Um, in lots of different ways, and this is a, a gross oversimplification, and, and everyone in this audience now knows, or if they didn't come into this meeting knowing this, they already know more about this than I, than I know about it. And um, we'll talk about data quality control, we'll talk about reporting, we'll talk about validation for clinical interpretation, and then we'll talk about using that evidence for clinical interpretation. Um, and, um, and, and we'll have a lot of time for questions uh, at, at the end, um, because, um, because that's what the point of this workshop is. So um, data quality control is important. Um, I, I care about data quality control in the clinical laboratory. We do a lot to make sure our clinical assays work really well and work well every time and work well for every patient. Um, uh, dynamic range is, is one thing to think about. Um, if, if the, if this is, this is the, the, um, the Greg Finley and Leo Sarita's um, uh, BRCA1 data kind of superimposed on what this is, if you, if you recognize it. Um, and, and this is a nice bimodal curve. Um, you, you have your, your benign variants and, and your, your pathogenic variants, but there's still something in between. It, it, there could be a greater dynamic range. It could separate benign from pathogenic even better. Um, that some assays, it's much more difficult to separate out what pathogenic and benign is, and it's very difficult to, to get a, a dynamic range. But dynamic range is really important because if you can't separate out the different, phenotype, different clinical phenotypes with the dynamic range of the assay you're going to be working with, then you might as well go back to square one. Um, and it's not, just not providing enough information to be, to be useful. Um, reproducibility is really important. Um, if you do the same variant, multiple, you really need to do the same variant multiple times because um, a point estimate is, is pretty useless. Um, without any confidence intervals. It's impossible to know if, that, if that, that one experiment was the lucky experiment or if that one experiment um, is representative of, of what reality is. Um, so, so we want reproducibility. The, 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 um, yeah, we, want, we definitely want reproducibility. We want that reproducibility to be right up front, which we'll talk about, we want to be to displayed clearly, which we'll talk about in a little bit more. Um, variant error, um, this is tied to reproducibility. We want to see how much error there is in the assay, so how much confidence we have in the point estimate you're giving for, for that P10 variant. That number one is that number is that is the confidence interval about the, the 1.02 estimate is that anywhere between 
negative two and positive three, or is that anywhere between 1.9 and, sorry, anywhere between 0.9 and 1.1? That's important. Um, it gives us a good, a good it gets the, the, the easiest way to see how much confidence, oh, forward one, how much confidence we have in this. So variant errors are really important. And then it, this is, I think this is nice, but not critical as comparison with other functional assays. Um, if, if there are multiple functional assays for the same variant, it's nice to see how they perform um, in relation to each other. Um, and that can be really important for clinicians who might be able to give um, suggestions to you as well. If, if there are areas where there are discrepants, then that allows us to know um, how, first how much confidence we have. And also, are there, are there clusters of people who have a different phenotype that one assay might be better at assessing one, it might, one assay might be better correlated with one clinical phenotype and the other assay might be better correlated with another clinical phenotype for genes that have multiple clinical phenotypes. That, that's a, that's, um, then the other thing is just, just to have confidence to know um, which, of the, um, which of the assays is gonna perform better and, and how well they relate to each other. Um, so I'm reporting. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different points we talk about reporting in, in this paper, but the bottom line is report everything, just, you know, whatever there is, and this has come up multiple times during, during the course of, of this um, symposium and workshops. Um, if there's raw data, report the raw data. We talked about before, if there's code, kind of report the code you use to analyze that. Um, if there's configuration files, if there's variant scores, if you've done multiple replicates, report, report the raw output for all the replicates, and so you, we can see how the confidence intervals are calculated and how the, the, those are, and we can see if there were outliers for that specific variant or if there weren't outliers for that specific variant. Um, report error estimates, report validation variants. This is really important as well. Um, there was a, a, a paper that, that um, in order to understand, this, this was for an in silico score rather than a functional score, but I could do the same thing for functional scores as well. Um, I, I wasn't sure how much to trust the, the scores that were created in a certain situation, they went back and looked at the raw data, and it turned out that um, all of the day, all of the variants that were analyzed, or sorry, seventy percent of the variants that were analyzed were analyzed for one specific type of variance, and then the rest of the variants were split between three other different variant types, and they were less common and um, more you know, less common to see pathogenic variants of those variant types, and so. It was, difficult for the people to be able to find those variants. But I was interested in those rare variant types. And the validation was really good for these common variant types, but not very good at all but for these rare variant types. And it was useful to be able to go into the raw data um, and have the data files available to be able to see, oh, this is what the variant set that was used to validate this data is. Um, maybe I should use this tool or the, the, these scores for those types of variants, and I really shouldn't use the scores for these types of variants. Um, the funny thing was, was that the, the paper commented that the, the score was really useful for all types of variants, including these ones that other, you know, half, half the, the, the conclusion was that we can use the score for all these rare types of variants um, without really acknowledging strongly that most of the validation was done on, on the, the, the different, more common subset of variants. Um, so include the list of validation variants, um, use the standard nomenclature. Sometimes it's tedious to go back to old papers and say, oh, this is how the variant was reported in old papers, and this is the modern um, uh, standard definition of the variant and going through and translating all of those. But it's really important to be able to see what variants were used to, to validate it, and, and also how many variants were used to validate which, which parts of the essay. Um, the clinical correlation. Um, so clinical correlation, more variance is always better. Um, even though the, the, the guideline from the other paper is 11 variants, if, if you can get more, more than 11 variants, that's great. If you, if you can have, if you can, the, the limitation is usually not the high throughput data, um, but the limitation is usually what, what data, the, what clinical data is available. If you can find additional collaborators or if you can find additional sources of, of high quality clinical um, phenotypes, or, then that's, that's wonderful. Um, be careful about phenotypes. Most of you, most of you, when you look at a gene, you become aware of this, but there's oftentimes multiple phenotypes for the same gene. And you might want to look at phenotypes completely separately. If there's different phenotypes for the same gene, you might want to, to, to look at those separately um, to be able to see if the functional assay performs um, differently for those. And it might, if it's, 
um, it might be better to, to analyze them and graph them completely separately. Um, you, might be, you, you might be surprised. You might either, either find the functional assay performs exactly the same for all of them, or that the functional assay performs completely different for each of them. Um, and that's an extremely use, useful piece of information to know. Um, and uh, it's, it's very, and, and the, that, sh, that could be a, a finding of, a, of the, the key finding of the paper published. And it could um, really inform people about how they should use the functional assay in clinical correlation if it performs differently for different phenotypes. Um, sensitivity, oops, here we go, sensitivity and specificity. So you know, make your cutoff, calculate sensitivity, specificity, that's fine. You, you, there's other ways to, to, to figure out what the clinical data is besides sensitivity and specificity. I personally like positive predictive value and negative predictive value better than sensitivity and specificity, but they're more challenging to know how to interpret those in terms of functional studies. Um, you could do rolling likelihood ratios by bins, which could also lead to more information. But sensitivity and specificity are the, the, the general ways, ways to, to calculate um, uh, how these can be used after, after giving a cutoff between pathogenic and benign. Um, and, and one of the, the, the things that, that in my conversations here has come up multiple times is, um, are you thinking about using this as in diagnostics or in screening? And, and that's really, really where positive predictive value and negative predictive value can come in. If somebody already has a diagnosis, and the clinical application is to say this person has a diagnosis and they have this variant, is this variant likely to be pathogenic? Well, there's already a high likelihood that that variant is pathogenic. And the, that variant is, um, and, and we, we think about information a little bit differently. Um, if there's functional evidence that's pathogenic as well, then that is, you know, that's concordant. And it's also a situation where, where that, that you don't need that much information to be able to, to classify as pathogenic. Um, if someone walks in off, if, if it's used in a screening method, then we're thinking about screening the whole population, perhaps. Or when we're looking at every possible variant, sometimes you're thinking about it in that context. And then it, it, it changes. If somebody walks in off the street and they're a healthy adult and they have a variant that your assay is calling pathogenic, um, is the evidence strong enough to be able to say that person is affected with the disease and they, they should be followed up on? Or is your evidence not quite strong enough to do that? The prior probability for population screening, um, especially in healthy adults, can be very, very low for a phenotype. And if the prior probability is very, very low, you need very strong evidence to be able to, to justify action. Um, and so sensitivity and specificity don't capture that. Um, but, but something worthwhile to think about to say, um, and it could be in the conclusion of a paper to say, you know, this assay works well. We validated it with people, we validated it with variants that had a high likelihood of, with our data set had 50% pathogenic variants or 70% pathogenic variants and 30% 30 um, benign variants. That sounds like something that would be consistent with diagnostic testing. And so we could, you could say, you know, this could be used in conjunction with diagnostic testing to help classify variants. Um, on the other hand, if you have an assay where you're trying really hard to find the benign variants and there's going to be more and more benign variants out there, you can say we've tested 100 variants that are known to be benign and 10 variants that are known to be pathogenic and we feel strongly that then that's you know, more consistent with population screening, that there's many, many more benign, if there were many, many more benign variants than pathogenic variants, then, then you could say you know, that this is, this is consistent with um, the types of variants that could be tested in population screening. Um, so, so that's just something to, to be aware of is, um, are you thinking about your test in a way that's going to be used for diagnostic testing? Or are you thinking about it in a way that it could be used for population screening? And it, the, the, the difference between sensitive, there's no, going to be no difference between sensitivity and specificity, but it may make a difference in how you frame your argument about how the variant should be used. Um, how, sorry, how the functional study should be used. Okay, um, I'm supposed to be wrapping up now because I'm almost out of time. So um, this is a little a walkthrough to see how, it, how we think evidence could be used um, more than just strong, strong pathogenic or strong benign. So does the data meet all the requirements that, that we talked about before? Um, if it doesn't, then we think that maybe you should just have supporting evidence be the maximum level of evidence. 
Um, and we should be able to use functional evidence as supporting evidence. We, don't, we shouldn't have to say either it's, it's good or it's bad and that's it, but we should be able to be able to use it. It's, it's it. Um, does the variant score and associated compositional support use of variant interpretation? So, so is, there, is there a dynamic range? Is, is, is there been enough variance tested to, to say it? If not, then it probably shouldn't be used as evidence. Um, and is this the only functional data being used? No. Are functional data consistent? Yes. Use only once as evidence. We don't want to combine two different uh, assays that are that are, are, are linear with each other, that they're, they're concordant with each other. Um, and um, can they be used in quantitative ways? And so you, you, you can use, um, if, you, if you can use quantitative information, then you can potentially use strong information, and potentially they could be used in larger information as well. Um, okay, so that's all I have. I, we have some time for questions, I think about five minutes for questions, is that right? Um, and these are all the people that works on the, the mutational scanning working group, and they may all have different opinions to me, but they, that, um, I hope that I presented the work that, that we did well. Um, I have a lab, small lab group, and work very closely with a lot of colleagues from laboratory medicine, and I'm really glad that I was able to present today, so thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think there's any rules about how good you have to be. Um, I think that the, the, the more important question is um, that um, you're honest and open about how good you are. Um, I think the, the, the problem with the, the, the issues that many clinicians have had about using functional data is not that um, the functional, the functional um, data, you know, gives a small amount of evidence or a weak amount of evidence or a strong amount of evidence, but more, um, there's been many functional studies that overestimate the strength of the study. And um, so if you're overstating the strength of the study or not, it, if it doesn't look like you're being clear about what the strength of the study is, that, then, then that's, I think, the problem. And, and we all want to overstate the importance of our research. You know, that's, that's just it's human nature to, to, to go out and say, I think what I've been working on for the last four years is going to be really important to someone, please. <laughs> and, and please publish it in a high impact journal. Um, but, but I think that the, 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 um, the, the, it's more important to state clearly, you know, we tested 11 pathogenic variants and it worked for five of them. <laughs> You know, and, and that's, that's what it was. Um, and it worked for every single one of the benign variants. You know, th th there's multiple ways that functional studies can be useful. And, and you could come out and say, um, you know, it works for every single one of the benign variants and only half the pathogenic variants. It has high um, negative predictive value and low positive predictive value um, or something like that. Uh, and, and so, um, so, so, that, so, so yeah, I think it's more important that you're completely honest and open about how well it works more than it has to work however well. There's no threshold for how well it has to work. It's a great question. Nick. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I do see it that there's strong evidence that gene-specific guidelines work better. Um, and so, so then your audience for your functional assay is really a very small group. It's, it's that those people that are making the guidelines for those gene-specific ones. Uh, I mean, there are committees that only work slowly. So if they, if they develop their, their guidelines and then you develop a cool, uh, you know, your, your, your paper comes out after, after that, um, and you have to go back and ask them to, to, to review it. But they're all people and they all want to do the best they can. And so there's no, there's no shame in forwarding them your, your results and saying, this is, you know, if you know who's on the committee and they're all public, and you know you're working on your gene, then you know, talk to them. And, and, but, but yeah, I, I definitely think it's moving towards 
gene specific things. I don't think there's going to be guidelines for every single gene. Um, there's just not enough people, not enough experts on enough committees. I think it's going to take a long time for there to be guidelines for every single gene. But the genes for which there is a lot of testing going on, they're going to have guidelines. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's that's the way it's going. And the evidence suggests that, that that's a, a better um, method than having these general guidelines. Other questions or comments? Great. If you have specific questions, I'll be around till the end of the meeting. And um, I also answer emails as well. So um, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Okay, so for our last talk of the day, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Tyler Starr. Uh, Tyler received his PhD from the University of Chicago and now is working as a postdoc at the uh, Fred Hutch uh, in both uh, Jesse Bloom and uh, Eric Madsen's labs. And he's conducting research on applying DMS to antibodies. And today he will be discussing how one can uh, study epistasis with uh, deep mutational scanning. All right, I'm excited today to proselytize about my favorite thing, which is epistasis um, and how we can study it using DMS, but also I hope by the end, um, I'll convince many of you who aren't even interested in epistasis per se, um, that there's one aspect of epistasis that can help all of us with our demutational scans to get better um, estimates even of single mutational effects. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out is that I'm gonna flash up a bunch of um, you know, short form citations for some examples I'm gonna show. Um, and so if you're interested in any of these papers, uh, remind me to show the long references at the end, or you can come talk to me afterward and I can point you um, towards some of my favorite papers. Okay. So the outline of what I want to talk about today is a brief example um, illustrating what epistasis is. Um, then I want to kind of convince some of us why uh, it's something worth studying. Um, then we'll talk about how we can study using demutational scanning, um, including kind of parsing out these two different forms of epistasis, global and specific epistasis. And then finally, I'll introduce really briefly um, a package that uh, Jesse Bloom has developed, um, which implements some of these epistasis analyses um, that could be broadly useful. Okay, so first, what is epistasis? And I think as kind of a word-based definition, we can define epistasis as the non-additivity of mutational effects. So it refers to when mutations combine um, with different effects than would be predicted from their individual effects alone. Um, and so I think the easiest way to illustrate this is with a quick graphical example. Um, we might have some phenotype of interest represented on the Y scale here, um, which I'll represent phenotype of um, mutants within one of these double mutant cycles. So we might have a wild type protein. And if we add this blue mutation, there's no change in the phenotype. This would be considered a neutral mutation. Um, or perhaps there's a different red mutation, which is deleterious in this wild type background. And so if these two mutations are non-epistatic or additive, um, then the double mutant can be easily predicted from these individual mutations alone. So in this case, this blue mutation was neutral on the wild type background, and it's also neutral on the background of this red mutation. So its mutational effect has not changed by the presence of this red mutation. So these two mutations behave additively, which is evidenced in this kind of parallelogram um, structure of this double mutant cycle. In contrast, if these two mutations behind, uh, behave epistatically, then the fitness or the phenotype of this double mutant is essentially anything else except this exact value. Um, and so in this case, perhaps um, the double mutant also actually has neutral um, fitness. And so in this case, um, the red mutation, which was by itself deleterious in the background of this blue mutation is neutral. And so this is an example of um, just one example of an epistatic cycle that could link these two mutants. And so now I think it's worth considering why we might want to study epistasis. Um, and the short version of what I'm going to tell you is that epistasis is everywhere and it matters. So um, for this first part, thinking about the fact that epistasis is pervasive, um, I want to briefly introduce one demutational scan that I'm going to refer back to several times because it has a really nice data set that's been um, an example in the field of epistasis for a long time. And so this is this paper from 2014 from the lab of Brent Soon, um, in which they took this really short protein, GB1, 
Um, and through some clever kind of oligo-based library design, they made this really precise library in which they have all possible single mutations, as well as exactly all double mutations across this short protein. Um, and then they exhibited, uh, they put this protein library through a um, ribosome display-based um, screening method to characterize the effects of all these variants um, for binding to its ligand. And so I first want to use this um, data set as an example about what I mean when I say epistasis is pervasive um, with one of my favorite figures from this paper, um, which is essentially showing all of the single mutations across this GB1 domain, um, just kind of rank ordered by their single mutant effects. And what they're showing on the y-axis is essentially the spread of like the variance of that mutation's effect across all the other double mutant backgrounds it was sampled. So for example, the, you know, the best mutants library um, in its best background has you know, a threefold higher enrichment than it did alone. Um, but however, in its worst background, it had a negative threefold enrichment. And so essentially, um, the vast majority of mutations in this library actually had their complete sign switch, at least across two different backgrounds in the library. So every mutation to this protein has some second background on which it might actually be a beneficial mutation, but it also has a second background on which might be a deleterious mutation. And so there's a lot of kind of epistatic interactions um, that can completely swap the sign of virtually every mutation to this protein, which I think is pretty neat. Um, but beyond the fact that there is a lot of epistasis within proteins, um, I think it matters for a lot of practical things that a lot of us care about. Um, so the first one that I know a lot of us are very interested in is uh, predicting the fitness of new mutations. Um, and there's been many papers that have demonstrated that epistasis is central to making good predictions about mutational effects. Um, one of the earliest indicators of this are these cases of what are so-called compensated pathogenic deviations, um, which are these observations where um, there might be a mutation such as F23V in some protein, um, which is a known pathogenic mutation. However, V can be the wild type state in other organisms in the same ortholog, um, which is quite puzzling. Um, and it actually complicates many of the ways that we predict mutational effects is by looking at alignments and seeing, oh, mouse has V, so probably V is okay in humans. Um, but with surprising frequency, um, these kind of wild type states and other organisms can be pathogenic in humans. Um, and that's likely due to kind of the broader context of this mouse ortholog um, having compensatory interactions with other differences found in that um, ortholog. And so this um, fact has been kind of leveraged um, in new kind of epistatic models, um, which take into account the broader sequence context of the ortholog in fish or whatever organism. So as I was describing here, um, more traditionally, previous approaches just looked at a single alignment column and might say, you know, since D is found at this position, it's non-pathogenic in humans. Um, and that could cause, um, you know, incorrect predictions that this D might be neutral in humans when perhaps it is not. And so this paper here, um, the Hopf et al. Nature Biotech paper, um, showed that by building a model from alignments that doesn't take single sites alone, but actually um, uses kind of alignment-based covariation <laughs> metrics, um, you can get better predictions of mutational effects straight from alignments alone without any um, functional assays um, that incorporate this sequence context, perhaps to correctly predict that A to D is pathogenic in this human background because it lacks the correct interacting epistatic um, states. Um, for those of us who are interested in engineering proteins or understanding evolutionary trajectories of proteins, epistasis is a central tenant. Um, and so the one example I wanted to show about this um, is the evolution of um, antibiotic resistance within beta-lactamases. Um, and so um, kind of going back to the origin of some of these beta-lactamase resistance mutations, people uncovered this really strong epistatic interaction of this M182T global suppressor mutation um, being important for allowing kind of the antibiotic resistance mutation to be tolerated um, in the wild type background. And so in the absence of epistasis, it was kind of unclear how this um, evolution occurred um, and really boiled down to these interactions between mutations, allowing um, these novel kind of phenotypic transitions to occur. Um, one thing that we've seen crop up in a couple of talks is this new idea that epistasis can help us do things like predict protein structures or predict macromolecular interactions. Um, and so this originated once again from these alignment based covariation metrics where um, if you can identify epistatically interacting sites, those can be constraints that are sufficient to predict the structures of proteins um, without any pre-existing knowledge about those structures. And now more recently, people, instead of taking these constraints from alignments, have been using demutational scans um, to identify these epistatic constraints and then predict the fold. And so this is an example of this GB1 domain using that data set I already showed before, 
um, comparing the actual structure of the GB1 domain in uh, the orange color to that predicted purely from these DMS-based epistatic constraints. And you can see they get the structure bang on um, straight from a DMS experiment. And then finally, demutational scanning um, and leveraging epistasis uh, can allow us to identify favorable mutations to a protein. For example, stabilizing mutations, um, which was shown in one of the early papers of demutational scanning, which might be familiar to some of us, um, in which they used the fact that some mutations positively interact with many other different mutations. Um, and these mutations um, are enriched for stabilizing mutations. And that's why they have this kind of global suppressor role. OK. So um, that's kind of a brief overview of some of the reasons we might want to study epistasis. Um, and I really want to quickly show kind of the, the reason why demutational scanning has emerged as a powerful way to study epistasis within proteins. Um, and really there's kind of two styles of these like high throughput or massively parallel assays that I think can shed insight on um, epistasis within proteins. Um, and the first is the one that we're used to kind of talking about these like broad demutational scans that maybe survey all single mutations and low order mutants across the entire domain of some wild type protein. This is what we're typically used to thinking about where maybe we take a, a gene of interest and we make, you know, NNS, oligo or primer based mutations. And then we end up with a library of variants of our protein, uh, perhaps with a range of, you know, one, two, three or a small number of mutations. Um, and then in the context of this background, we can think about how the single mutant affects predict the double mutant phenotypes and identify deviations from those additive predictions. Um, the other type of kind of massively parallel assay that people are using to study epistasis are these kind of combinatorially complete samples of mutations across smaller numbers of positions of interest. And so what I mean by this is um, you can take maybe four or five positions, um, just given the numbers, and make all combinations of all 20 amino acid mutations at these small number of positions um, and characterize all of those comprehensively. Um, or if you kind of reduce the number of states you look at, um, for example, if you have two variants of interest that differ at up to 20 positions, you can sample the binary space combinatorially between those two proteins um, and determine the epistatic interactions amongst all of those kind of differences among your two proteins. And so these um, kind of actually differ in their design from these more typical broad mutational scans. Um, and they also differ in kind of some of the ways that you might want to study the epistasis. So if any of you are doing experiments like this, I would definitely recommend checking out this paper here, which lays out a really nice way to represent and study the epistasis in these kind of combinatorially complete um, mutational libraries. Um, but going back to kind of these broad mutational scans, since I think that's what most of us do, um, I just wanted to show, once again, going back to this GB1 protein, um, what epistasis might look like. Um, so basically, if you have all the double mutants of a protein along with their single mutational effects, you can look at all of the epistatic deviations. Um, for example, on average between any pair of sites, as well as the actual 20 by 20 grid of mutational states between all pairs of sites. Um, and then do all of these other things that I was talking about, like predict structure and stuff like that. Um, and you can also look at kind of the patterns of epistasis and see that, for example, these positive epistatic interactions, so where the double mutant performs better than you'd expect from their single mutant effects, tend to cluster with these three-dimensional structural contacts. That's kind of what gives rise to this idea that epistasis can predict structure, um, whereas the negative epistatic interactions you can actually see are more kind of dispersed across the structure. They're not these specifically interacting pairs of mutations, uh, but they seem to be emerging from something a little bit more general. And so that's kind of what gives rise um, to this big uh, kind of discrepancy between these two forms of epistasis, um, which I refer to as global and specific epistasis, and which I think are quite um, important to think about um, when you want to study epistasis. And so the way I wanted to illustrate what kind of global and specific epistasis are is thinking about this double mutant cycle I was showing previously, where we have you know, our measurable phenotype here and this particular type of double mutant cycle. And so when we see epistasis, um, we're saying there's some non-additivity in this linkage between sequence and the biological property that we're actually reading out with our assay, um, which in particular with deputational scans can be a quite um, kind of extensive translation of the sequence and the physical properties it encodes into the enrichment-based metric, for example, that we record with our mutational scans. And epistasis can kind of emerge anywhere on this map from sequence to measurable property. So um, to kind of illustrate how epistasis can emerge in sort of two different forms in this mapping, um, I'm going to lay out kind of a thermodynamic example um, where perhaps we have some physical properties such as the stability of a protein 
um, which has some sort of nonlinear relationship with the biological property that we're able to measure, such as function or the fitness of an organism uh, that that function confers. Oh, sorry. Um, and then to kind of facilitate the next two figures, I'm putting a gradation of color on this nonlinear mapping where white corresponds to stable proteins that are functional. And then there's this kind of gradation where this threshold begins to drop off to like the non-stable proteins, which are also correspondingly non-functional. And then what we're gonna do is essentially take that scale and flip it over to the y-axis of these double mutant cycles. And so I'm gonna show two different double mutant cycles which illustrate these specific versus global epistatic couplings. So in this cycle here, um, we can see once again, this would give rise to this cycle here where it's neutral, neutral, deleterious. And the reason is, is that this red mutation is destabilizing. So it takes us off this threshold. We end up with a dead organism. The blue mutation is kind of neutral with respect to stability and therefore with respect to function. Um, but the blue mutation actually changed the changes the stability effect of the red mutation such that it's only now mildly destabilizing and we kind of stay above this threshold as a uh, stable and therefore functional protein. This is in contrast to something like this where perhaps the blue mutation is a stabilizing mutation, the red mutation is destabilizing, and they don't actually change each other's effect. I don't know why this jumps ahead on its own. They don't actually change each other's effect, but when we combine them together, we're still above this stability threshold, and so we end up with a functional protein, functional protein, functional protein, but dead in the middle. And so, sorry, that again. Um, these illustrate what I refer to as specific epistatic interactions versus this global epistasis. So specific epistasis emerges because the blue mutation and the red mutation are altering each other's effects on this underlying physical property of stability. Whereas this global epistasis is only emerging because of this global nonlinearity between protein stability and our measurable phenotype. And because of this relationship, there's a few key differences between specific and global epistasis. Specific epistasis tends to be few to few in terms of the number of interacting partners, whereas global epistasis can be many to many. The reason for that is with global epistasis, any mutation that is equally stabilizing can compensate for this red mutation and exhibit this type of double mutant cycle like I showed before, um, because any kind of counteracting stabilizing mutation is able to keep you in this kind of stable, um, non-thresholded regime. Uh, whereas in the case of specific epistasis, it's really only a few kind of contacting pairs that are able to modulate each other's stability effects in such an idiosyncratic way. Um, kind of linked to that idea um, with specific epistasis, because these are kind of these idiosyncratic interactions, um, they're often spatially proximal. And like I said, these are the ones that allow you to predict structure, um, whereas not specifically kind of global epistatically interacting sites can be distributed anywhere across the protein. They're just kind of counterbalancing, stabilizing, and destabilizing um, mutations in this example. Um, then once again, in this thermodynamic example, therefore, um, this specific epistatic interaction term is actually invoking a delta, delta, delta G term, Right? So this is the delta delta G of the, of the red mutation. This is the delta delta G of the red mutation in this background. Since it changes, that's a delta 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 G. Uh, whereas in the global epistasis background, the delta delta Gs of these mutations are not changing. So they're not invoking a third order delta um, G. So um, I think this is kind of a, you know, slightly artificial example. We don't really know what this mapping between stability and function always is. Um, but what is general about this type of thing is that um, there are lots of nonlinearities in the mapping from true molecular features um, and the biological properties that we're able to measure, for example, with demutational scanning experiments. And sort of any kind of nonlinearity in this mapping can give rise to epistasis like this that's not arising because of true molecular interactions, but rather because of these global nonlinearities. And so therefore, um, I think it's interesting to think about whether it is kind of best to consider epistatic interactions like these that emerge from global interactions as like specific places on a heat map where we should say these are epistatic interactions between these two residues, or if it would be better to kind of come up with ways of capturing this global nonlinearity and then only estimating the specific terms on the background of those nonlinearities. It's a little bit more parsimonious to invoke a single nonlinear curve, which can explain many interactions like this, um, and then leave just these specific interactions to be um, further explained. And so that's kind of the premise of this approach um, that has been proposed in this paper from Jacob Optonowski, who's actually now here at University of Washington, um, about a method 
for inferring the shape of these global nonlinearities in these sequence function maps, um, which then allows you to kind of parse out the remaining specific interactions on those backgrounds. And so um, I'll give you just a brief overview of what the math of this kind of inference looks like, uh, but I won't go into too heavy of details because quite frankly, this paper describes it much better than I probably can uh, via speaking. Um, but basically what this kind of method invokes is um, it kind of starts with what you might expect if you wanted to predict the, or you know, uh, represent the phenotype of some genotype that contains multiple mutations, um, you might just write down a linear model which says the phenotype of variant I is the sum of the mutational effects of the mutations that are present in that variant. So these betas are the single mutant effect terms and you just have an indicator variable that's a one if variant I has that mutation or else a zero just to cancel out that term when summing the betas to represent that mutant. And so this would just be, I don't know why this keeps moving. This would just be um, a linear model that doesn't capture this global nonlinearity. Um, and so basically to make this a global epistasis model, um, you just add one more link, which says that the actual phenotype that we observe is some function G of this underlying additive phenotype. And so in the case of this paper, um, the particular type representation of this G function is just this um, general kind of flexible function that really the only restraint it um, puts on is that the relationship between your observable phenotype and the underlying phenotype is monotonic across the range. Um, it can't kind of go up and back down. But beyond that, um, by kind of combining these basis by spline functions, it can adopt a bunch of different shapes. Um, so I wanted to show you on this GB1 example, um, what fitting this kind of global epistasis function with these main effect terms looks like. Um, and so that's what's shown here is on the y-axis, this was the phenotype from their mutational scan. And on the x-axis is this underlying additive trait that they fit with these main effect terms um, that gets translated into our observable range. And so you can see here, um, there is, you know, kind of some window of the observable trait where there is kind of a monotonic, like uh, dynamic range. Um, but you can also see that this additive trait is picking up on the fact that essentially this dynamic range has a floor, like any dynamic range does, um, beyond which you're not seeing any change in the DMS function, but it's saying there are worse and worse phenotypes that are just all masked in the deputational scan. Uh, but you're also starting to see that there was an approaching of a ceiling in this deputational scan. I think one way to visualize this is just the, the distribution of functional effects in this demutational scan. And so this is kind of what we're used to seeing where you have like a neutral window and you have a bunch of things clustering at a particular deleterious range. And I think this kind of points out the fact there aren't all of these mutations that have a phenotype of exactly minus six, right? Minus six is just the most depleted you could see something. And so what the additive trait is doing is saying, like this phenotype is continuing to get worse and worse and we're able to pull that out because of the fact that we have multiple mutants in this landscape um, and it gives you a better kind of smoothing out of the dynamic range above uh, beyond the ceiling and the floor of your assay. So um, I just wanted to end by plugging um, this package that Jesse, uh, Jesse Bloom has written called DMS Variants um, and it's a Python package that um, its main purpose uh, initially was um, to provide some useful functions uh, for kind of keeping track of barcoded variant based demutational scans. Um, but more recently, he's implemented this Otwinowski version of this global epistasis analysis. And so if that's something you're interested in doing, um, this package has really extensive documentation and it has a bunch of kind of Jupyter notebooks which illustrate its use. And so I found it super useful to be able to just pull these notebooks, change the input and get them running pretty quickly. Um, so if you think that this is something you want to apply to your data, um, I definitely recommend reaching out to either me or Jesse um, and we can point you to where to get started. And so with that, I'll just say thanks.